um, this client fired us um, via an email earlier this week. It's just part of the it's part of the business. But this one hurt um, because, well, one, you know, th there's the relationship aspect there. All right. Welcome to Amazing Marketing, where we talk about math and emotion because math and emotion is in everything and it's in marketing. Those are kind of the most important things. And we're talking about data on the math side. We're talking about stories and making things interesting, hooking people into whatever it is that we're marketing, whether it's something that you're selling, something that you're trying to influence. But in any case, marketing is truly amazing. I'm here with Chris Gray. I'm Dmitry Smirnoff. Let's get this show rolling. Chris, how are you? Dimitri, what up, man? I am just enjoying the day very much. I love talking about marketing with you, and I love talking about everything. Uh, in this case, we have a really cool episode where we're going to talk about lawsuits, massive <laughs> companies, small companies, and then a little bit from the arena. You excited? I am, and I love what you said about math and emotions. Uh, for some of you out there, may know Dimitri very well. Um, for you, for you people who don't, uh, Dimitri's excellent at at. He's one of the unicorns. I was, if you guys aren't familiar with that old movie Blade, um, it's an old Marvel movie, and it's about this half vampire, half human guy who's called the Daywalker because he could like walk in the day that he was a vampire. And when it comes to attribution, math, and emotions, when it comes to marketing, I think that. Dimitri is a day walker, a unique blend of somebody who can really understand the data and then put it into a story. And I think that that concept is applicable to several different things. But in the world of marketing, when you can really understand the data, which has become harder and harder with attribution, which we'll talk about later. But when you can take the data and take the puzzle pieces, put them together and then paint the story of it for your client. I mean, the the world is your oyster. Um, so anyways, I, I, I like that direction, sir. Yeah. And, and data is super important. And, and we see it in our own world where we're doing internet marketing for our agencies and, and you're running your agency as well. I know that, that you intersect with data quite a bit too. Um, but at the same time, data alone is, is not enough. It's never enough. And there's a million third-party platforms that provide all the data that you want, but if you can't interpret it and build a narrative around it and actually decide the direction they're going to go with, it's pretty much useless and oftentimes throws you off and into the wrong direction. So data is important, but arguably not even as important as emotion and stories, which is really the core to the human experience. And Chris, yep. you're, you're, as far as I can tell, just uh, an absolute ninja expert at stories and emotion. I'm looking forward to getting your opinion on some of the emotion and stories that's going on in in this lawsuit that we're going to talk about in the next segment. But first, um, as you guys know, we do a segment called From the Arena, which is a quote, which is a, a very cool, what is, I mean, is it a quote? I don't think it's a quote, but it's, I actually want to read part of it to you because I don't think we've read it uh, quite yet on the episode. Um, nope. But it's Teddy Roosevelt, right? Teddy, yeah, Teddy Roosevelt. The whole thing is uh, effectively that a lot of people can criticize when they're not doing the work and they're not in the arena. And it's the one who's in the arena, even when in a losing effort, is the one who earns the respect of, most importantly, himself or herself. So I guess that was a summary, so I'm not going to read it. Maybe we'll do it on another episode. But but we both really like this quote. And um, Chris, I believe you have something from the arena this past week. Let's get into it. Yeah. So speaking um, of emotions, it's crazy. I am on this journey on detaching myself from my emotions, experiencing them, but not letting them wash me away with them. And I, that was truly tested earlier this week. So um our agency it, we're very we're very boutique small family oriented um, we're not trying to grow too fast or anything like that we've done well and as a result uh in our industry we we mainly service home service contractors with that business and you know it's, much, it's a good old good old boy network for the most part 
But what's important there is relationships. And we pride ourselves on that. And so we had a client, a client who helped. It's one of those foundational clients, one of those clients that kind of change the, the, the direction of your business because they're big and you kind of build your business um, on the foundation of clients like that. And that's what happened. This is one of the clients that helped us really build our company. Had them for 14 years, which is unheard of in the marketing world. You, you, if you can keep them for four years, that's amazing. 14 is unicorn type stuff. So you have them for 14 years. When you have somebody for 14 years, you develop a working relationship with them. You know about their kids. You have, there's a relationship there. Long story short, um, this client fired us um, via an email earlier this week. Oh, now we're in, geez. yeah, yeah. That just hurts yeah. me to hear. Yeah, man. And, you know, we're in this world. If you're listening and you're in the agency world, you understand you get, you get clients and you lose some and you do your best. And it's just part of the it's part of the business. But this one hurt um, because, well, one, you know, th there's the relationship aspect there. So let's talk about the relationship aspect. When you're with somebody for 14 years. And you tell me, Dimitri, if I'm wrong, but. We felt that. In that relationship in particular, to get fired via an email was rough. It would be like your your boyfriend or girlfriend of several years breaking up with you via a text. Like we felt there maybe should be a conversation like, hey, guys, look, we think you suck right now. And we're giving you a month or something to get together or we're out. Or, hey, we're, we can't afford you guys right now because things are so tough. What can we do to make you guys affordable? Because in the email, she made it sound as I think that it might have came down to money at the end of the day, right? Which could be worked out. Like we would we we would take a bit of an L to keep them because it's just it's one of those foundational clients, one of those clients that whether it's right or wrong, you do a little bit more because you've had them for so long. At least we would, right? Um so we would have we could have we would have worked with them in several different ways, but to be fired via an email and not see it coming. It's just, it was very abrupt. Like I said, it's like being broken up with via text. So that one hurt. And that one, that was an emotion that was hard to detach from. The second one is that this is a client that, you know, 25 K a month. Um, and we're okay, right? Like we've signed enough clients this month to make up for that, but we still took a 25 K L we're okay. But you, you, for you out there in the arena, you can imagine where the brain starts to go. Like it starts with, okay, 25K, uh, we lost 25K. And even though everything's okay, it could, your brain starts to go to, oh my gosh, are we going to make payroll? Which is not the case. But it starts to go, they're like, what if we lose that client and this client and that client and now we can't pay bills? And all of a sudden, I get killed. I, it just it just gets out, of, it gets out of control really quick, right? That's my point. And so in the arena this week, Dimitri, um, that's what happened to me and I'm interested on your thoughts. Like when you have a client that's not somebody you've been with for two or three years, one of those foundational clients, and you know what I mean. I mean, how is there a right way to end that working relationship? Am I expecting too much? What are your thoughts on what I just said? Yeah, after 14 years and it being a foundational client, that is understandable to be emotional and, and to expect a lot. I think with the end of any relationship, it very rarely goes well. I mean, it's the end, it's an end, it's an end of something. Yes. And um, to me, the first thing I thought of was communication and something we've talked about and I've shared as well with the, the, the mo mode of communication is, is often one of the most important things. And in this case, email is, suggestive of that maybe the communication that you guys had over the years at some point deteriorated to some degree where where maybe the trust wasn't quite there to share open and honestly and an email an email firing to me is is a is a more cowardly way of going about it and it's maybe an embarrassed way i don't Maybe they're embarrassed about it. Like you said, it's a money thing and they don't want to tell you that it's a, necessarily it's a money thing or we found someone else who's going to do it cheaper or 
because it has been so long, they also probably understand that. Hmm. But it hurts. It, it hurts even just listening to that. Plus, it's a sizable client. You, you wish it w- it could have gone differently, like you said. And if and I'm and I'm sure I completely agree with you that if you guys got on the phone with no time limit and oh and and being open about it, you would have worked out an arrangement that would have actually been better for everyone. Yes, unless they just hated you and never told you, which is messed up too. But assuming that that's not the case, I'm sure there was a solution in here somewhere. And just because of embarrassment and assumptions, they're assuming, oh, well, they won't go for this and they won't understand why I have to do that. So embarrassment and assumptions is what what costs this. And it's it's the driver of the, the pain now because you don't really understand why it happened. Yeah, man. And so am I, do you think that it's, am I taking it too personal (laughs) versus, Hey, this is a part of a business, man. Yeah, that depends. I think the ultimate, I think that in the, like in all, I don't even want to say ultimate businessman, but I'll just go with that for now, is that you pretty much separate all the emotion out of it. You take all the emotion out of it. When somebody fires you, hires you, kind of like a professional poker player. If you ever get emotional about any hand, a bad beat or a lucky break, if you're if you celebrate a lucky break, you're screwed because you're going to you're going to just fall apart when you get on a run of unlucky breaks. And the same thing here. Uh, I, and, and I think Hermosi, I heard him talk about this too, is the higher that you ascend in business suggests the more emotional tolerance you have. Because mm. the higher you go and the higher the stakes become, the higher the swings are too. And if you can weather them without taking a toll on your psyche, you can keep ascending, but everyone just goes up to the ceiling that they can tolerate effectively. So, you know, it it just, how much of the human can you take out of it? That only you can say that. And for everybody, it's going to be different, but can I blame you for feeling and taking it personally? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm taking it personally on your behalf. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah, that's a really good point about the hormone, the hormosi, uh, statement and this is this is a cousin to what you said not exactly what you just said but i was talking to uh, a friend of mine her husband just started uh jiu-jitsu and he was talking about how it's a constant exercise in humility right he's in there getting you know he's a 40 something year old man just getting murdered by some kids essentially right whether he's stronger than them or not and he's he's talking about how it's a constant practice in humility. And I told him, again, it's a cousin to what you just said, where the higher you go up in the belt ranks, the more intense that humility gets. Because if let's, you know, in jujitsu, there's a white belt, blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, black belt. In order to advance through that, those stages, it typically takes 10 years before you get your black belt, right? That's typically what it is on average, if you get your black belt. And the higher you go up, let's say you're a brown belt, right? The belt right before below, below black, which is where I'm at. Yet I'm I'm having a hard time with a blue belt, which is the belt right above a white one. That will mess with your psyche because I'm supposed to be better. Like I'm supposed to be. Um, and so anyways, when you said that about the higher you go up, it's more of a practice in emotions. And I thought about that with jujitsu. The higher you go up, it's a practice in emotions. That's a transferable principle. So thank you. Yeah, dude, that that's a tough one, and I appreciate you sharing that. And in, when we talk about emotion in in, in business, and when we're talking about emotion in, in marketing, that's one thing because you control the messaging, and it's the person on the receiving end that's going to feel that emotion that you're creating. 
Although I will say, even in the creative process, you have to pretty much feel those emotions as well. Uh, yeah. like artists, musicians, actors, I think you can argue that they they feel the emotions much harder than anyone else. So I actually, I, I'm curious to ask you about that since you are a creator. Do, when you create um, your more emotional pieces, how does, does that affect you at all personally? That's a great question. I, I liken it. That's a really, really good question. Um, let's take one of the, the example that comes to the top of the mind is the, the email business where we're, the GOP emailing business we have. For those who don't know, we we have a, a publication marketing uh, business where we send content content to the people in the GOP party, and then we also monetize it via ads and things like that. Um, and the main thing there is to put in an email subject. The most important thing there is our email subject lines. That's what. Without that, without click through rates, that those are the you know, lead generation and getting people to actually open the emails. The opening of the emails is where the monetization happens. That's the most important thing. So how do you do it? Well, you got to have emotional headlines. Like they got to have something that makes people react. And um, what I've noticed is like if you, let's say there's a meal that some kind of spe specific meal that your mother makes, Dimitri, some specific like Russian dish um, that your mom has made I don't know, thousands of times, tens of thousands of times at this point in her life. When she's making it, she can like test it or she could like taste it, understand, oh, I need to do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. She can give you the exact ingredients, but you can't make it like she can. She'll take it and she'll be tested and she just knows. It, it's become intuitive because she's had so many reps, right? That's what happened with us. So that's what happens to me with stories and email headlines. You write so much that when you take it like after, you know, I'll, I'll read it and I'll know, did that make me feel something or not? Like that, did that potentially, ooh, like that, it's almost like tasting the food and be like, ah, oh, I need a little bit more salt or whatever. Like you could read the email subject line, like, ah, this needs a little more flavor. Let me change this. Word. Oh, now it's, now that's it. That's it right there. It becomes intuitive because we've done the reps to understand what that, to develop that intuition. So to answer your question, yeah. Um, I taste it for lack of better words. I'm, I'm almost like tasting the the headline or the story when I write it to see if I can, if it evokes something in me. And that's taken time to develop that, develop that. But anybody can do it. My team of copywriters are there now because they've written so many headlines. Yeah, that's, that's, that's cool because in, if you don't approach it from an emotional perspective, it's just a statistical play in the numbers game. You can put in a hundred variations, ask chat GBT to put them and then take the best performing one. There's no emotion in that, but I don't know if that's going to outperform something like what you're doing because you're actually using your own instinct and your own reaction which is hard to do. I bet that's hard to do is like actually test yourself. How, how am I reacting to this without it, this being a real um, like natural experience? It's something that you're testing. So I bet that's something that you learned over time to really understand and read your own reaction to it. Yes. It's, you, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier at the beginning of the segment, how I'm practicing detaching emotions. Part of that is watching the emotions develop in you. And, and so when it comes to the articles or the headlines, it's like, you know, you read them and then you, you start scanning your body for, did something happen when I read that line or just as important, did something not happen? If I read this entire thing and nothing happened, maybe I need to kind of gauge what I'm writing here. This might be even a bigger topic of um, because we've talked about how to disconnect from work when we're trying to do personal stuff. And I think part of the difficulty in disconnecting lies in this emotional state as well. There's some emo there, there's some um, part to this, I think. Where, I'm talking about your client now leaving in, in that case. And like, 
it's hard to disconnect from that. You, you, it's not like you could just put your business hat on. It's like, okay, now forget about that. That's already in the past. And I'm just going to continue working and we can use those as testimonials, get some new clients. Maybe we'll get even better clients. So this opens up new, like the business hat. And then you have, of course, your human hat. And, and then with doing personal stuff, you want to put on your personal hat and put away the business hat. And it's, it's hard to do all these things. So I think, um, the, the 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 kind of the parent issue to this is how do you how do you focus on the on the thing you want to focus on instead of what your brain is making you focus on that's a massive question and there are literally people who spend their entire lives mastering just that yeah that's like some zen buddhism yes. stuff that yep. we'll have to have somebody on to explain to us in detail. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing the from the arena and, and hearing real life stories like that, that are actually happening and real wins in this case, real losses and, and pain felt. And Chris, I, I definitely feel for you. I'm sure the listeners feel for you as well. And we're hoping that you'll be able to, and maybe one day even work it out with that specific client because again, fourteen year relationship isn't chump change, uh, yep. and and hopefully you're able to replace and and multiply that that lost income. Thank you, brother. Okay, let's move on to the lawsuit that we want to talk about, which is a big thing. Now, this is more of a international, global uh, on on center stage in the world a lawsuit that's happening to the biggest company in the entire known universe (laughs) called Apple Inc. Chris, what's going on with them? Apple's getting sued for allegedly having a monopoly on smartphones. I'll read a small uh, paragraph here because I don't want to just talk off my talk off the top of my head because I I don't know all the exact reasons, but a quick little summary is that the DOG alleges Apple has met competitive threats by imposing a series of shape-shifting rules and restrictions in its app store guidelines and developer developer agreements that would allow Apple to extract higher fees, thwart innovation, offer a less secure or degraded user experience, and throttle competitive alternatives. So what I took from that, and if you're an Apple user, um, you may understand too that Apple basically says, look, um, we have our rules and we'll change them whenever we want, make them fit whatever we want. And if you're using some shit on this phone that we don't want you to, we're going to make it either not allow you to use it or make it a shitty user experience. Hence, um, communicating with somebody who has an Android phone in my experience, sending videos or getting videos from somebody who has an Android phone. It's all fucked up and stuff and all small. So things like that, they are getting sued for. Dude, that specific thing to me is hilarious that they do that. Then in the whole green text, the green text bubble, and like, you know, who's this loser that I'm texting? That's what you get. <laughs> By the way, this is coming from a lifelong Android user who just switched recently, and I, I'm snobby now. I'm snobby to the green text, and it's it's genius marketing. And I'm surprised Google hasn't just done the same thing back to Apple. Like you would think, like Apple's messing with you. Why not? Mess with Apple back. You're you're a big company too. Like you're 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 not. You may not be number one in terms of market cap. Let's see. Google. My, my guess is they're number three in the world. Like that's pretty dang big. And maybe it might be number two. Pretty impressive. But okay. So like so they're getting sued by the Department of Justice for taking actions to uh, reduce competition in the environment. So how does that make you feel? <laughs> you know, I think that the, Apple needed something. They needed a kick in the balls. Uh, as we all do, when we, you know, you get too cocky, it's 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 good to be brought down. That happens to me often. Um, and I think Apple, let's look back as marketers here, for those in the game, you remember back in, what was it, 2000. 21 when they did the ios 14 update was that 21 or something or uh, maybe 2020 2020 or 2020 well, back then 
iOS did the iOS 14 update. For those who aren't familiar, it's when you install an app and then at the app itself will say, hey, it'll give you some message that basically says, hey, do you want this app to spy on you or not? And of course, you're going to say, no, don't spy on me. Well, what happened? Well, let's look at Facebook. Facebook has so much data on people. Phenomenal ad exchange. Um, well, when Apple did that, they kicked Facebook in the balls. Facebook lost a ton of money that, that, that year due to that iOS update. And Apple starts doing things with that. They start getting funny with email. They automatically open all the emails. If they just start, they started messing with their shit, making it harder if you're an outsider. My theory behind it is that Apple was moving towards their own ad exchange and this, that, and the other. But my point to all this is that Apple has a lot of power. They make up their own rules. And that can be frustrating quite often. And for me, when I read this, it's not quite um, in the marketing arena. It, it can be for sure. It can be for sure. But it's not like they're being sued because of their marketing practices. But it's it's uh, it's always interesting to see the bully get bullied. Yeah, because there, we do have a handful of bullies and and Apple is one of them. I think the department of justice can be classified as another. Now I I do stand corrected. Apple has lost its number one spot to Microsoft recently. Microsoft has been an absolute tear in terms of market cap and Google comes in at a lowly, lowly number five behind uh, NVIDIA and Saudi Armco, which is a oil company, which is back up now in Saudi Arabia. So Microsoft, Apple, Google, NVIDIA, Amazon, Facebook, these are all in the top 10 and they're all bullies and they all compete with each other. They also need each other. Like you mentioned, Facebook needed Apple to keep letting them do their thing. And maybe it is a competitive thing where Apple will come out with its own ad exchange because look, check this out. Okay. And you, and you mentioned Apple lost a lot of money because of this. So, I mean, uh, Facebook lost money because of the iOS 14 update. And, and really it was that marketers could no longer effectively show ads to quite the same degree that they used to. So, so the update was in 2020, people kept spending in 2021 as a growth period, but in 2022, it's hard to say what exactly is correlated, but they, their net profit their net income fell by nearly 50% that year. Damn. And yeah, and I think it has a lot to do with that iOS 14 update cuz in our world a lot everyone was complaining about it. They were freaking out and they needed to diversify. How do I get on Google Ads now? How do I get other traffic from somewhere else? What do we do? What do we do? And eventually it was corrected. But for a year or a year and a half it was it's kind of a really big problem. When you were looking up um, the companies that you just listed uh, with Microsoft and Apple, what did you, under what category? Biggest tech companies, biggest, like, what was that the category? Biggest companies, period, in the world. Biggest the companies, world. period, yeah. in the world. Yeah. What, what led to Microsoft? What do you think, if Microsoft is now number one, what got them there worldwide? What do you think? Well, actually, Microsoft and Apple have had a intense rivalry. They're they're pretty much their entire known history, including their founders, Bill Gates and um, Steve Jobs, because they came up around the same time and the companies were founded around the same time, and they both were super popular. But they they, they were they had very competing systems, one being Windows and and the other being uh, like iOS or it was it was called um, I don't remember if it was always called it was obviously not always called iOS. Um, I'm drawing a blank on it. But but the point is, it's two different operating systems altogether. Yeah. So you would so it would and, and, and you guys remember the commercials where um, you know, there would be the young kind of young adult who would pick the cool 
Apple product versus the lame old person Microsoft product and kind of, and so there's this cultural split between the two of them, but they were both huge companies. The founders had very well-known and strong personalities as well that were very different. And so they've had this rivalry where they go up and down, up and down, and Microsoft took a huge lead at one point and, and Steve Jobs was out for a while and then Microsoft came back. I mean, Apple came back and especially after 08, I think it was 08, where uh, the iPhone sales just took over, <laughs> you know, like they, they took, they completely destroyed BlackBerry at that time. And, and that was, and, and the rest was history. Um, Microsoft though, the, to answer your question, why, why are they number one over Apple who has so many amazing devices? Well, Microsoft also has devices, number one, which is not the, the biggest part of their business. They have Microsoft Office, which is huge. It's just, it's on pretty much every system that runs anything, <laughs> uses Microsoft Excel or Docs or something along those lines. Now there's Teams, there's um, hosting. I think they make a ton of money from hosting similar to the Amazon uh, AWS. Microsoft has that. So they just have, they built this massive web of services Microsoft has on top of their devices, on top of their operating systems that at this point, and they've been sued to be by the Department of Justice um, for being a monopoly as well and, and in using unfair business practices. There's even like, there's um, old footage of Bill Gates walking to the courthouse and getting pies thrown at his face, which was funny back in the early 2000s when he was fighting with the DOJ. So it's kind of been a back and forth with these two. It's just the Apple had the lead for a while. And then I think only in the last year or two, maybe my Microsoft has come back again. I was thinking of it. I was, I did not thank you for that because I didn't consider the software aspect of Microsoft. Cause even on my, on my Mac over here, I have Microsoft office so that I could mess with it from time to time, even though I'm mostly in Google docs and Google Excel, I'm uh, downloading stuff or whatever it is or saving stuff. It's saved in the Microsoft office um, world. And I guess my brain was like this, where I believe if, if you're messing with Apple, you probably have a higher medium median income, right? Or if you walk into an office that has all Macs as the, the, the desktop preference uh, preferred using uh, computer or whatever, that's probably a tech startup, probably a company that's making doing well. Um, and I was thinking in my head, like, and those things are not cheap, right? Apple hardware by itself is not cheap. So I'm like, yo, I thought that they would, their stuff is so expensive that although worldwide, a a regular, like, uh, Microsoft doesn't have hardware, really, do they? Do they have computers or, or anything like that? Do they? They don't. Is there a Microsoft? There is a Microsoft, like. I don't think it's a big part of their business. So they crush it on software. Yeah, it's mostly software. It's software, server products, cloud services. Uh, and then they have a little bit in gaming, like Xbox and stuff like that. They own LinkedIn. They do have Bing.com, which does bring in some search advertising revenue. And that's what, like, in, in terms of a competitor, Google would be most of their revenue would be coming from, from search, Google.com. Interesting. I just didn't think it from, I thought that Apple would be ru running the world or beating them from just, just, just a hardware perspective, but yeah, Microsoft from has hardware, yeah. definitely. I think hardware. Yes. Hardware. Apple is, is by far the leader, um, server and cloud services. Microsoft, I think is the leader and Amazon is second, a very close second. And th then Microsoft differentiates itself with office products. Like you're mentioning, you, you still use them windows they have. And then, and then gaming, LinkedIn search, et cetera, a few devices, but, but not big as far as what I can see here. So yeah, like every, every of these big companies has what it's best at. Like Facebook is best with just straight up advertising and same with Google, actually uh, Amazon it gets its, most of its revenue from amazon.com, but most of its profit from Amazon AWS. So then back to the, 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 the lecture at hand here with Apple being sued, what are your thoughts on this lawsuit? I'm a little bit, 
uh, I would say jaded in a certain way and when it comes to the government being involved in business because there is certainly a role for government to reduce the risk of monopolies. I don't think anybody truly wants monopolies to exist because that way there's no price discovery and there's no innov there's slower innovation, put it that way, uh, a lot slower. And so it's not good, but, but anytime the government has to be involved with something, it just, it's a slippery slope. And I think, I think that uh, the government plays a, a part, plays a, a big significant role in actually creating the monopolies themselves in the first place. And then they have, and then they try to fix the, the problem that they created themselves through, you know, friend, friendly regulations that they'll offer to big companies, tax breaks. Uh, and then of course, allegedly, you know, hush hush deals and things under the table, handshake deals like that, that, um, are, are bad for true, uh, free market competition. So in this case, yes, I think it is important to make sure that the big dog, the, all the big dogs need to keep each other accountable. And yeah, in, in many cases they work together, but fortunately we do have, at least we have several big dogs. You can make the case that Apple is more powerful than the Department of Justice, although that's a difficult, that, that, that's like pretty comparable, but at least we also have Google and we also have Amazon. We also have Facebook. Um, so at least there's several big dogs who all want that top spot and they're all like, you, you never know if it was Microsoft. Hey, how come you're not suing Apple? Hey, Department of Justice, go sue Apple. You know, like you never know what's mm, happening exactly know. behind the scenes. Then playing the devil's advocate here, because me or my, the devil's advocate for me, because I I'm kind of like, hey, you know, Apple kind of gets a little kick, which I think is good for them in a humility standpoint. But I'd, I would I'd be saying something different if I own that company. So let's think of an owner of, of Apple or a CEO of Apple, somebody who has significant stake in the company. Is it so wrong to be like, look, this is my platform, my software, my hardware, and you want to come put your shit, my competitor, you want to come put your shit on my software or my hardware? Is it wrong then to make it more, more difficult for my competitor to thrive on my hardware and software? Well, from a shareholder's perspective, that's what you would want to see for, for sure. That's what you want to see. But the interests of the shareholders may be different from the interests of the, the population at large. And and so everyone's going to have their own incentives in the, and they have to go about doing something uh, based on, on who they're serving. So Apple may know that they're breaking the law. And this happens all the time, by the way, that with banks. Look at banks. Look at pharmaceutical companies. They knowingly, and this is this is not a conspiracy theory because you can read the what the fines are about. But these companies knowingly break the law because they know the fine will be significantly less than the net gain for the shareholders. So, from a perspective of the shareholders. Uh, putting ethics aside, I suppose, just from a, a revenue and profit perspective, yes, try to eliminate or roll up or whatever, any competition from the perspective of the citizens, in this case, the citizens of the United States represented by the Department of Justice, which is, you know, you can make, um, make your claims that that's not really the case. But anyway, in theory, that's the case. So as the citizens, you don't want Apple doing that because you do want other competitors entering the market to continue the free market process of lowering prices, improving services, and so on and so forth. When you said that about Apple or whoever, whatever, pick your company, doing some stuff that they know that might be shady, they might get their, slap, their hands slapped for, but the money they make from it will be significantly greater than the fine they will get for it. 
that makes me think that's a cousin to the way like gangsters think. Let's talk about mobsters in particular. There was a former mob boss. Um, I forget his name. I was reading his stories. He does a lot of YouTubes nowadays. He was a, you know, he was a boss. He was a hit man. He was a big, big earner, big earner. And that was his thing was they had this thing where they were scamming. They were cutting money off the top of gas. They had all these different gas stations. Basically, they were getting money from the gas and not paying the government. They were just big, big money, made big money off it. And he basically said, yo, we knew we would get caught. It was cat and mouse. We were running and running and running and running. But the money we made from that was worth a few years in jail, worth the hand slap. Like, they were able to hide that stuff. So it's just funny how the, the parallels of big corporation versus organized crime. Yeah, well, I, I think I think I think that there's parallels because the issue is, is deeper, and it's in all of us as individuals. You, 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 I mean, forget about organized crime. Look at petty crime, even, um, or any type of crime that that's just uh, you know one off or one individual doing. It's still a a question of risk and reward. Everything is risk and reward. Yeah. You look at countries with. Uh, laws that are like Singapore, if you do drugs or you steal, there's a very significant penalty for doing that. And many may argue that it's excessive. But the fact of the matter is people aren't willing to do those crimes because the risk is not worth the reward. Uh, in other countries, it is worth it. It is worth it. And, and that's why you see certain crimes. It's all based on incentives and yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's one story that particularly bothered me about Wells Fargo, uh, the bank, where I, I can't even believe people are still using them. And, and they're actually, now I still have this list of biggest companies in the world. And I bet you if I scroll down here, um, Wells, or let me do a little quick control F if I can find Wells Fargo. But here's Bank of America. Let's see if Wells... Yeah, so number 56 in the world, biggest company in the world. I'm not even talking about the United States. Uh, at $200 billion market cap. And this bank knowingly, knowingly created accounts for its own customers, extra accounts, that would then hurt the customer's credit scores. There'd be fees, monthly fees. They'd put, they'd, they'd like throw other accounts in because the account, everyone from the, from the pretty much not quite the teller, but the, the, the account managers to the bank managers, to the regional managers, to the directors, VPs, and so on, everyone was incentivized for more and more accounts. And even the big brass was aware of these uh, illegal practices and they, they'd allow it. They'd allow it because the fine ended up being, um, and I don't remember exactly now, but let's just say it was like, a couple billion dollars, like, okay, but that was worth doubling their market cap from, let's say, 100 to $200 billion. Um, and, and so what? So, yeah, I mean, you look at all these big, the, like some of the biggest frauds in the history, and this is why I was saying I was a little bit jaded about the governments being involved. You, you like when, um, when the biggest uh, frauds happen corporate frauds i mean they usually get hit with a fine and warnings and but no people go to jail typically they don't go to jail um and that's messed up because like that and that means no one no one has to pay the price and so there you go the risk doesn't exist um say, and and just to finish that thought because I guess I'm on a roll now. It's like you look at 2008 and the banking crisis that happened, and and you and you see that the banks and other companies too, like even the airlines, all these companies took enormous risk in order to multiply their profits while not leaving any space for like a margin of error in case the stock market goes down in case the economy drops. They didn't have it. They were buying back their stock. They were lever over leveraging their trading desk because they knew worst case scenario, they'd be too big to fail. And again, there is no risk and it's a moral hazard. 
And I think, yeah, I mean, with Apple, there's moral hazard too. So it's good that they're getting some kind of check. Taking that, that is a, um, interesting perspective where my mind went when you said that was much to a, a, like another way of saying what you just said, right? And I'm not supposed to be, I shouldn't be repeating what you just said, but what it made me think of is you're right. Like you can do some egregious stuff, but depending on who you are and the weight you have within the given context, you could, you might suffer, you might suffer temporarily, but you'll be okay in the long run. Let's look at like professional athletes and sexual misconduct or being accused of it at least. There was an old quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger, for the Steelers. I believe he got accused of rape. He went through whatever he went through. I'm not even sure if he got suspended. It was an accusation. But you fast forward, you know, he, he retired two or three years ago. Um, he went through that period of being accused of rape, and there was some stuff there that was it's, – it's, it's, it's alleged, right? But it was – anyways, there was some stuff there that happened, and he goes through his thing – but then his career keeps going, and when it's time to retire, he's held and celebrated as a great quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers, as if this rape thing didn't happen. Um, Kobe Bryant, you know, God rest his soul. There was a period there where um, he got accused, of, he got caught with some, I guess he's had, he did something with a masseuse or something, and he did it. Like, he actually did it, and he got exposed, and he's about to get divorced, and this and that, and it's all you saw on the news. Um, but what he do? He just, Dave Chappelle said it best. He beat that case on the court. He went to the court. He performed, got some championships. Nobody's talking about that rape case. The rape case are talking about the championships. And there's just case after case of this with, with, with every sport, with, whichever sport you pick. If you're a high profile enough athlete, even Tiger Woods, and you have some kind of sexual misconduct accusation or get accused of it, you can literally beat that on the field or the court or whatever it is and just go scot-free. Uh, and that kind of ties back into marketing. <laughs> What's Well, first of all, winning is amazing marketing. If you win the championships, plus you got to have the personality too, because, you know, um, Tim Duncan won championships, but he was never – the personality. So I don't know if he would have necessarily gotten away with something had it gone down. <laughs> um, if, if there was some kind of misconduct on his side, but there are some athletes that, that were never able to market their way out of it quite like Tiger Woods or even Michael Jordan with his gambling and other things. Uh, Kobe Bryant, like Lance Armstrong, he just got crucified and, and could yeah. never come back. And um, I guess it has to do with marketing. And man, I, I kind of feel bad for him because he, I mean, he had that whole live strong thing. Everyone was wearing the yellow bracelets. He was raising tons of money. He was doing a lot of good things. And yeah, he did, he did cheat, but many people have cheated. <laughs> and it's just, it's interesting why, depending on the sport or depending on the personality, uh, some people are allowed to win it, win back the love of the public and others either aren't able to or aren't allowed to. Yeah, uh, Lance Armstrong is a good point. And it's, you're right, it's about how you go about painting the view of you post the accusation or post the, the scandal. Whatever, whatever happened with Lance Armstrong, it crushed him. And that was it. He, he was done. Whereas you have other athletes out there who've had much more serious accusations and they come back, they come out of it, you know, okay. Like everything's fine and, and it keeps moving. So it's all about at the end of the day, I guess a story that you're able to tell or paint. I bet that there are roles in organizations, sports organizations and PR obviously, but even more specifically than PR for the, team itself, but also PR for the ownership, PR for the players themselves, and different PR companies are going to be better than others and give you better or worse advice. And it may depend on the time of year, you know, like 
if you do something sexual misconduct in the Me Too era, like you're going to be done for forever. Like, um, was that news anchor Matt Lauer and that movie producer guy? Like, they're they're effectively done forever because they just it happened to them at the wrong time in terms of, um, like those couple years were, were very intense. Whereas if it had happened now, I bet they could have recovered. So there's just some luck involved in it. Now, depending on the, on the actually what happened, like I don't even know what, what happened in those cases, but I just know those are the most high profile ones that went down at the time. And how great you are, how, how much you've built your reputation, your public reputation at the time, because some of these people are pr- kind of more private. Uh, and then something happens to them, they try to recover. But even going back to Bill Gates, right, from Microsoft, CEO of Microsoft, if you go back and look at the news from early 2000s, he was the pariah of the United States or maybe of the world. Everybody hated him. But fast forward 20 years later, everyone's asking for advice on every single topic from technology to AI to pharmaceuticals to vaccines and all that stuff. So he was able to recreate his public persona. And by the way, he's had some serious accusations uh, (laughs) as well. And in fact, like word on the street is that his divorce has to do with things that went down at at, uh, Jeffrey Epstein Island and stuff like that. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of weird out there. This is probably like something that would be really cool to analyze. Like, why does some people, why does it work for some and not for others? That I wouldn't consider Bill Gates charismatic when I, you know, obviously he's brilliant, but he doesn't, he doesn't draw me in when he talks, but he's brilliant. But for him to go through the, the, the things that he went through in the early 2000s, and then you have, you know, the Epstein Island type thing. The dude was getting blamed for COVID, bro. Like it, there was, I saw there were people who thought he was behind it. I mean, you got blamed for COVID, man. Yet this cat, here he is, number one company in the world still. It's interesting. Yeah, and, and quick funny note on that is I'm going to look up a list of the richest men in the world. Um, richest, well, not men, people, because I think we, there is a woman on there, but let me double check. So, okay. Uh Here's another, this is another rival. We were talking about Apple, Google, Microsoft, but who's the richest person has just been this zigzag between uh, Bernard Arnault, which is the uh, Louis Vuitton owner, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk have been, and now Mark Zuckerberg is up there, which is crazy. His net worth 5X in the last year or so, about a year and a half, because Facebook was way down and now is way up. Mm-hmm. Um so, but Bill Gates is number seven now. He used to be one, number one for decades. Decades he was number one. Now he's number seven. And the number eight guy is Steve Ballmer, which is a Microsoft longtime CEO. He's only $5 billion behind him at $126 billion. <laughs> he was not a founder, not a founder. He wasn't with the company that long. He was just their CEO for a long time. And guess why? Bill Gates is only $5 billion ahead of him. And, he, and, and quite frankly, he's going to get surpassed very soon because Bill Gates sold most of his Microsoft stock and Steve Ballmer held on to all of it. Mm. Interesting. Word on the street was that Bill Gates' friend Warren Buffett said you had to diversify. You can't just keep all your eggs in the Microsoft basket. And now, and now Warren Buffett is ahead of Bill Gates. <laughs> little friendly competition there. Get your buddy down. Anyway, $131 billion. Like at that point, it's not, it's not, it's not that they, they care about the money you know, because there's literally nothing you can't buy, but they care about the rankings, I'm sure. Some people say with this money, uh, making money like that, right, it's just a way to keep score. So I imagine at that point, if you do care about it like that, then I I wonder if they're, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how that type of person ends up thinking. Like there might be on one hand somebody who's up there who makes a bunch of money and doesn't care. On the other hand, there might be somebody, somebody on that list like, 
I want to be number one, right? It's all about keeping score, which that's, that's a whole nother topic. Well, I, I, maybe one thing that we'll talk about in a future episode is personal branding and not that we are experts in it. And it just be an interesting topic to discuss further. What are these people doing and is it just related to the individual themselves, the team around them, the connections that they have, because if you have connections, let's say to the, to the media uh, infrastructure of, of the main companies that are around and like, let's say, you know, you have, you have the ear of, um, you know, Google and Facebook and, and uh, all the TV stations and you can, if somebody can do you a favor where they're not going to run a hit piece on you, that's an, that's a big advantage. Um, so there's probably a lot that goes on into it, both from a huge level like this international, but also from a, from a micro level, just, you know, everyday people, uh, trying to build a business around themselves or even market themselves for a new job or a new relationship. What does it have to do with, marketing when you are marketing yourself. I think that that would be a good episode. There's a lot to come. There's a lot that goes with your, your personal brand. I think we talked about this here recently. I mean, we, um, in the world that we, we walk in, there's some people, you know, so there's exactly, there's exactly what you just said. And there's a personal brand aspect of what you're known for. Some people are known for their super long hair. Some people are known for always wearing black and being very blunt. Some people are known for telling like really dirty jokes or whatever. And the trick with these types of people and their brand, um, not the trick, but some of them learn to lean in to what makes them unique. Like you want to alienate the people who, who don't vibe with you because now you're going to attract those who do. And that seems like, yeah, for sure I do that, but that's, that's easier said than done, in my opinion, when you're really coming out there with a strong, divisive comment. Um, but yeah, that would be a, an interesting topic to explore. And and maybe we can even tie that in as how divisive do you go depending on your tolerance for, for haters? Yeah, man. Like, uh, who said it? Steve Sims said one of the best at it in the world is is Trump. Trump, he just, he's just good. Like he, he, it's hard to be on the fence with him. And then that's a sign of great branding. Some people have kind of mastered where I don't think anybody dislikes them, you know, like the rock and Oprah, <laughs> they, they kind of, everyone's like, although they did have their little mishap with the Maui fire situation together, but yeah, yeah. aside from that, yeah, that <laughs> they kind of blew it there. But, you know, like, I think it's also possible to, not that they don't have haters, of course they do, but a lot fewer than Trump. They don't have the whole, half the world trying to destroy their their life and everything, you know. Yeah, that is a brand by itself is to be loved by a lot of people. We know people who are just, just, just super likable, and that's their brand, like lovable, bubbly people, not, not that The Rock or, or Oprah are bubbly, but to your point, they're lovable, they're they're widely um, liked and loved by the public, and that's part of their brand. So, yeah. Well, all right. We talked a lot about the math side of things. We even uh, mentioned some profits and revenues and market caps. <laughs> um, and we talked about emotion. We talked about the stories that some of these companies are telling. We talked about some personal stories. This is more of the format that we're going to try for the foreseeable future. So let us know how you like it. And uh, well, we're looking forward to talking about the next subject on math and emotion. Yeah, we appreciate y'all listening. And um, you are very much so watching um, Dimitri and I practice what we preach in the sense where, you know, you know, people want to be entrepreneurs. And they'll sit there and they'll come out with a business plan and they're like, should I have the landing page and should I do this, that and the other? They'll do everything, but go ahead and just do it and then figure it out and course correct as you go. That's very uncomfortable. And 
our our podcast at this stage. It's fun. You're watching us, man. We're trying to figure out what the hell we're doing, and we're we're course correcting as we go. And and the only way the only way you do that is to actually go do it and learn from the things that are working and the mistakes you make. So we appreciate y'all listening and watching us go through this real life exercise. All right. Until next time. Peace.